we are officially back. That's right, we are officially back. This is Race and Ethnic Relations on Campus Podcast Show, podcast show number five, number five, and I am Dr. B. Yes, right, Dr. B, bringing it to you once again. That's right, this is Race and Ethnic Relations on Campus Podcast Show number five, and it's entitled Reparations. That's right, (laughs) it's entitled Reparations. Reparations. Uh Uh-oh. Wow. Am I going there? Yes, I am going there. Again, the show is entitled Reparations. Oh, my gosh. Well, let me just say, it's, it's nice to be back. I took a little time off because, again, so many things to do, uh, that's happening this summer, 2019, and, uh, and said I, uh, but there's something that just jumped out on the radar. And actually, I was going to do another show on, uh, actually, on the, the Health Disparity Show. But this really jumped on the radar and is really on the national agenda as I speak. <laughs> it has invoked lots of media attention nationally. Uh, and yet, there's some folks that want to completely avoid it. So, I'm not a person that's going to avoid the obvious. So, that's the reason why this show number five is entitled Reparations. And uh, again, I, I, um, I bring these shows, uh, the race and ethnic relations on campus shows, because there are a lot of significant issues happening on Uh, campuses today that uh, tends to get overlooked. And these shows, these podcast shows, focus on on all the relevant and practical issues that college students face when going to school uh, uh, with uh, students who are like them and who are not like them. And many of these issues are overlooked. And this issue of reparations is something that truly gets overlooked on college campuses, but now since it's in the national news, because guess what, U.S. Congress, there are federal hearings, as I speak, about the issue of reparations in Congress, U.S. hearings, talking about reparations, people are testifying, African Americans are testifying, all types of individuals are testifying, but prim- primarily uh, African American activists, uh, scholars, actors, people in all types of walks of life are testifying uh, in support of the issue of reparations. And, and yet there is denial of uh, or not uh, the other side saying that okay we cannot possibly do this but anyway it's a bill it's uh, in the uh, uh, being debated about and uh, it's it's just started uh, I don't have all the details but I had to go and return to this issue of reparations and let me just say this uh, I want to uh, have a shout out to all my Instagram followers all my oh, we're also on uh, Apple's podcast. I want to thank uh, uh, Podbean. I want to thank uh, Spotify. Uh, I, I want to take uh, thank my Twitter followers. Uh, again, if you have any comments or questions, please do not hesitate to email me at ejb678 at gmail.com. This is one of the most controversial topics uh, always through <laughs> our history. And I just want to give you a backdrop on the issues of reparations. Uh, I'm not going to get into the heated topic right now, but one of the things that that tends to get overlooked is uh, the foundation of a lot of these issues related to uh, race and ethnic relations. Uh, in the earlier shows, I uh, defined uh, uh, some of the practical issues of of race, uh, issues of ethnic relations, uh, issues of prejudice, issues of discrimination. But now we're going historically in our United States. 
about the issue of reparations. Now, it's just kind of ironic. Uh oh. Uh, not only I, I really uh, uh, we touch upon it in my latest book, uh, Race and Ethnic Relations on Campus: Understanding Empowerment and Solutions for College Students, because these are this is that was one of the uh, topics that came up in class, but it yet not necessarily in print uh, on my book, but. Believe me, my students have already talked about this. Uh, and now that it's in the uh, national dialogue, the narrative, uh, I just happened to publish an earlier book called The Cultural Rights Movement, Fulfilling the Promise of Civil Rights for African Americans in 2010. In 2010. And I have a complete chapter, a complete chapter on reparations. And, and matter of fact, it's chapter 7 of my book, the cultural rights movement. And I wrote this book back in 2010 because it was a big issue some nine, almost ten years ago in our country. Because nine, ten years ago, guess what? Uh, we had uh, our first African American president, President um, Barack Obama, and the issue of reparations came up when we elected Barack Obama as our president. So let me just give you a quick backdrop on uh, some of the things, a few little things that I I wrote in chapter seven on reparations, and I, I start off the quite uh, the chapter saying, "Have you heard it? Can you feel it again? Have people been talking about it in the barbershops, hair salons, and churches across the country? Well, the rumblings are stirring up again in the black community about the issues of reparations." Basically, reparations is a proposal made by some people in the United States that some type of compensation should be provided to the descendants of enslaved people. Reparations would be paid in consideration of the labor provided for free over several centuries, which have been a powerful influential factor in the development of our of the country. The issues of reparations has been a very touchy sensitive and polarizing topic in the United States for years simply because a majority of blacks and whites have opposing opinions about it that is true even today again the issues of reparations have been a very touchy sensitive and polarizing topic in the United States for years, simply because a majority of blacks and whites have opposing opinions about it. For the most part, blacks are in support of some type of reparations, financial or symbolic compensation, and whites are not. That's in just general. Although there are many exceptions to this broad generalization, the word reparations can invoke an emotional response from an individual, whether white or black. Again, emotions immediately come to the forefront. And that's what we see, and I noticed uh, on the testimony uh, uh, in the uh, uh, U.S., uh, in the hearings on reparations today in 2019, the summer of 2019, the emotion from those who are testifying they're literally crying. They're literally pleading. And they're literally demanding reparations today, 2019, for descendants of American, African American, of the, uh, of the past, but also present. And many times, uh, we and here's here's the issue. A lot of folks say, "Well, there is no no descendants. There's no living descendants of those who were enslaved." Oh well, yes, there is. Cause in the testimonies, we're starting to see a lot of older rest older African Americans who are descendants of of those who have been unfortunately used in our society years ago and these individuals are 100 and some years of age and they are 
talking about their parent, grandparent, grandparent, uh, as when they were enslaved. So what we're talking about, let me just give you some context to this. Because uh, many times we don't have a, a, basics, uh, a basis of our foundation of this. In a brief history of reparations, uh, I believe is just kind of necessary. Because, <laughs> uh, again, we, we, we fail to forget the impact of slavery very much felt today in 2019. And you say, how can this possibly be? Here. Here's, here's the research that I did in my book, Cultural Rights, The Cultural Rights Movement. Check this out. You know, very quickly. The first Africans arrived in the New World in 1502. By the time the slave trade ended in 1860s, more than 100 million blacks had either been killed or transported from their homeland. Although statistics on the trade are imprecise, it appears that from 400,000 to 1 million of the 10 to 50 million Africans forcibly transported to the Americans came to North America between 1619 and 1808 when the legal slave trade ended. Hundreds of thousands more captured in wars started by, uh, started by Europeans were smuggled into the states illegally until 1860. Eventually, the race of such groups, uh, uh, the race of such groups as the Shanti and Dahomey, uh, so disrupted and depopulated West African states that rulers began to protest against the trade. African rulers, unfortunately, were powerless to stop the trade. From a historical perspective, the importance of the institution of slavery in the United States is evident in three areas. Okay, are you following? Again, I give you a quick basis historic hi history yet the importance of institutions is in, uh, uh, important in U U.S. is in, uh, evident in these three ways first it was a major uh, determinant of the um, uh, American race relations the legacy legacy of slavery led in in the 19th century to the institution of Jim Crow laws designed to separate blacks and whites to segregated housing and segregated housing and schools to discrimination and the dispensa dispensation of justice to myths about interracial sex and to economic and political oppression. Second, slaves place a crucial role in the transformation of African cultural element, elements and the creation of a unique black culture in, um, in the Americas. Third, Although African slaves contributed much to American culture, they stood as America's accuser. As long as black people labored in chains, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution symbolized uh, America's uh, ability to lie to itself. Having lived so long with this lie, European Americans found it increasingly difficult to resolve the dilemma between equality and discrimination once they uh, once they had ended the conflict between slavery and freedom. Thus, <coughs> excuse me, thus reparations stem from a breach of contract between newly freed slaves and the U.S. federal government. The formal period of slavery, slavery ended as a result of the Emancipation Proclamation signed in, signed in 1863 by President Lincoln. In January 1865, slaves were promised, among other things, quote, a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground in, special field, in a special field order, number 15, issued by General William T. Sherman. But three months later, the order was rescinded by President Andrew Johnson and the U.S. federal government seized the land, and it, it already had given to 40,000 blacks in Florida and South Carolina. In the end, approximately 4 million American-born slave men, women, and children across the nation were freed without one red cent. 
Although this initial action of reparations for blacks at the time of Civil War and Emancipation Proclamation was rescinded by President Andrew Johnson, it caught the attention of many other individuals and organizations thereafter. It was not until 1969 when James Foreman, a former executive secretary of the Student Nonviolent Coordination, a SNCC, S-N-C-C, an organizer of the uh, Black Economic Development Conference in Detroit, Michigan, demanded at a church service in New York City that blacks receive a down payment of $500 million for unpaid servitude during slavery. Eventually, the controversy, debates, and events surrounding James Foreman's incident inspired liberal Yale Law Professor Boris Bicker to write The Case for Black Reparations in 1973. Wow. The movement reemerged in the late 1980s. This time, its advocates came mostly from law schools and embraced. Uh, Bickers had once ruled out lawsuits against private parties, but supported the case for black reparations. Let me stop right there. So again, there is a basis where the federal government has stipulated, had promised, put into action, put on the books that slaves were promised a plot of land in compensation. Yet after a change of presidency, the U.S. federal government denied, seized the land that was given to 40,000 blacks in Florida and South Carolina. So they rescinded. It was actually, the process was started, but it was rescinded to those initial 40,000 blacks, African Americans. So what does that tell you? The federal government, our federal government, said it was time to give something back to Americans who gave their lives who helped build this country through free labor, through enslaved labor, to give their them or and their descendants land and an opportunity to cultivate property. And now that is a legal precedent. This is a legal precedent. So they rescinded again and again. Decade after decade. How do you feel about that? Think about it. There's no denying about the history here. Hello folks. There is no denying about the issue of slavery. And these were the this is the 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 historical impact, underlying impact of race relations. It seems unimaginable in 2019. It seems unimaginable to many of my college students. But I have to remind them that this is how it was. And even though they kind of know it's not real, yet when you document things and you show a connection and you show people 
who have been affected by the lack of the, the lack of commitment by a U.S. federal government. A promise that was neglected, that was rescinded. And now we have hearings about it. So yes, this is very emotional. This is a, a time where people, organizations, are nervous. Because we we are talking about a denial again and again and again by our federal government. To the direct descendants. <coughs> Excuse me. To the direct descendants of those who were promised. And many times people blow this out of proportion. Are they going to, do we, our federal government have to pay every black person in the United States? No, they're not talking about that. But there was specific number of African Americans, blacks, who were promised. Who were identified back in 1865. Okay? So, again, our federal government was coming in line with that. Yet it was rescinded. By President Andrew Johnson and the U.S. federal government. Our federal government is accountable. Again, I used to work for the federal government. Love working for the federal government. And one of the things I know is that there are laws. There are mandates. And our federal government always has to adhere to those laws and mandates. This is one mandate that needs to be reckoned with, to be acknowledged, to be enacted for those who were promised reparations. It's not a, it really is not. An ethical thing? Oh, oh yes, it's not a. It, it's a. It, it it is a numbers thing. Because we know the federal government, they they, they rescind things again and again, uh, and, and and oh my gosh, I, I I'm just saying that. <laughs> uh, it's it's when you work for the federal government, you you try to go to the law and land, and you try to uh, present different gray areas. Uh, over the years, well, this is there's no gray area here. It's a black and white issue. Our federal government government has promised. Slavery was a part of our United States for centuries. This is the least, the least our federal government should do for those specific African Americans. Hello. That's all I'm saying. Take the motion out. Just look at the facts. Look at the history. It's very plain and simple. That's all I'm saying. People like to throw all types of emotion in it. And I can understand that. But I, I get rid of the emotion. And I'm saying this to my African American audience. Take the emotion out of it. It's hard, but take the emotion out of it. I'm saying this to my other audience. Mainstream audience. Those who disagree with it. And they're of all backgrounds. Take the emotion out of it. Just look at the cold, hard facts. That's all I'm saying. Look at the cold, hard facts. It's there in the history books. It's there in the legal books. It's there in the federal government. It's that simple. Let's not make this more complicated. And when everyone puts in the motion, that's where it makes it controversial. They purposely make it more controversial. It's not. Step up and adhere to the law of the land. Simple as that. 
the issue of reparations is not going away. That's the reason why I wrote about it in 2010. And now it's the one of the biggest issues during this summer in 2019. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get bigger. It's just starting. But it's going to get bigger. And it's going to come back again if it's not resolved. Oh yes, it's going to come back again if it's not resolved. So let's see how this plays out in our administration, in our, what is this, our Trump administration. <laughs> let's see how this plays out. Mm. <laughs> there you go. This is, <laughs> I'm going to end right there. <laughs> this is uh, uh, my race and ethnic relations on campus podcast show, show number five. I am Dr. B. It's entitled Reparations. There you go. If you have any comments or questions, please do not hesitate to email me at EJB678 at gmail.com. That's right. And uh, listen to me. Download a show or two or three or four or five uh, on, uh, on Podbean, on Apple Podcasts, on uh, <laughs> iTunes, and uh, also on Spotify. Uh, check me out on uh, Instagram and Twitter. So thank you again. I'm 26 minutes in, almost 27 minutes out. Uh, talk to you again soon. It's time to get real. See ya. Peace out.